Welcome everyone. My name is Asher Miller and I'm the executive director of Post Carbon Institute. I'm excited to be joined today by Philip Ackerman Leist, the director of Green Mountain College Farm and Food Project and the author of Rebuilding the Food Chain. Philip is going to be sharing with us today some of the insights and practical knowledge he learned in the process of writing Rebuilding the Food Shed and meeting some of the amazing men and women who are re revolutionizing the food system in communities across this country. But before I introduce Philip, I just want to extend my thanks to our friends at Transition US and Chelsea Green for partnering with us to organize this series of community, community resilience chats. Today's web chat is the first in the series of conversations we're hosting with the authors of the Community Resilience Guides and some of the organizations and individuals featured in those books. Um, I'd also like to briefly explain the format of today's conversation. Full disclosure, actually, earlier today, we attempted to do this live and to provide participants with an opportunity to ask questions directly of Philip. But unfortunately, the technology decided not to be cooperative. And so because there is such an interest in the topic, we opted to re-record the chat, though that meant, unfortunately, that our audience can participate live. However, I will be asking some of the questions that were submitted to us, and I want, want to invite those of you who are viewing this recording to use the discuss comment area at the bottom of the page to submit questions. Philip and I will do our best to respond to these there. Um, so Philip and I are going to chat for about 30 minutes, and then um, we're going to uh, start getting into some of the questions that, that folks asked. Um, as soon as the recording is live, uh, we're, going to, we're going to be sending an email out to people who are SVP'd. Uh, and, um, send along some additional resources to help you be part of the effort to rebuild the food shed in your own community. So without further ado, I'd like to very briefly introduce our guest. Philip Ackerman Lice is the author of Up Tunket Road, The Education of Modern Homesteader, and Rebuilding the Food Shed, How to Create Local, Sustainable, and Secure Food Systems. He is also a professor at Green Mountain College, where he established the Farm and Sustainable Agriculture Curriculum, is the director of the Green Mountain College Farm and Food Project, and also founded and directs a Master's in Sustainable Food Systems, the nation's first online graduate program in food systems, featuring applied comparative research of students' students' home bioregions. So, Philip, thank you for joining us again today for the second time. Really appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. And second time's always better. <laughs> yeah, let's hope, yeah. So, let's just get, um, let's step back for a second, and why don't we just start with, uh, with a simple question, which is, what do you actually mean when you say rebuilding the food chain? Sure, I, I think it's worth looking at a couple of images that may may help reveal some of, of what that might mean or share. And um, you know, the, just the term food shed in and of itself is a really interesting um, concept, and so we'll explore that really briefly. But um, first, maybe to get folks to think a little bit about how we got to where we are, I think that's really important. And then I think it makes it clear why we need to rebuild the food shed or food sheds, if you will. So this first map that folks see, I'm going to show four here. And the first map is um, from 1850. And the colors that you see here um, represent actually um, how much of the economic activity of particular counties in the United States are, were based on agriculture. And, um, and that's really important. It's important to note that the county level data is something we use quite a bit when we talk about food sheds because it's really the most accessible and the most granular, if you will. So the, um, this is 1850, and I'm going to do this in 50-year increments. So it's interesting to watch the march across the country and to really look and see you know, what things actually um, show up here in terms of patterns of movement of agricultural economic activity. So here's 1850. Here's 1900. This next one is 1950, 1949. And the next one, about 50 years later, close to 2000, you know, we see what we have here. And um, it's really fascinating as we start to think about this progression, this march across the United States with um, the expansion and shrink in some places, shrinkage in others. And um, you know, as we go back to 1922, we can get some clues to what happened. And this is um, a story that starts to help frame the notion of um, why we need to reclaim food sheds. But it, um, it's not the only story. And essentially what I'd like to emphasize here is that you know, you know, we could probably summarize this in many ways, this whole process, um, and what we're trying to do with rebuilding the food shed. I would say in many ways that it's actually a reclaiming, a renaming, and an unsaming. And um, so let's get into that just a little bit here. So as you look at the Armour Food Source map from 1922, it's an absolutely beautifully done map. 
It was actually sent to schools and um, libraries around the country, produced by the Armour Meatpacking Company. And the emphasis here, and I'd encourage folks to find this online and actually read it, the emphasis here is really on specialization, starting to break the country down into areas of specialization. That obviously worked well um, for Armour and some of the other companies at the time. And um, it's not that specialization in and of itself is problematic, but when we're doing it and sacrificing you know, almost all the diversity in terms of agricultural production, that's when it gets to be a problem. So this is um, 1922, early 20th century. And then uh, this is actually a photograph I just found a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it, what it really represents is the um, fragility of the food system in many urban areas, even in the early um, 20th century. And, and of course also in rural areas. But what this is showing is um, New Yorkers accumulating food in uh, 1916. They're gathered around the railway stations because there were strikes, railroad strikes, uh, uh, very often in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, and also the threat of those strikes. So whenever the threats came, people started really to um, you know, come and get as much food as they could, even at that time. So this starts to give us a little bit of sense of um, you know, the notion of resilience and um, really what we need to do in order to be able to have some self-reliance and um, a sense of food security for ourselves. So, um, you know, the, the, all those railway strikes and the threats of those railway strikes uh, really um, struck home for Walter Hedden. He was actually the head of the Port Authority for New York City at the time. And Walter Hedden uh, was thinking about the term watersheds. That was a term that had come into play in the, the late 19th century, early 20th century. And um, he was thinking about watersheds, but also started to um, think about the notion of how it might be applied to food. So he actually adopted the word food shed. And here from his book, How Great Cities Are Fed, he says, the barriers which deflect raindrops into one river basin rather than into another are natural land elevations, while the barriers which guide and control movements of foodstuffs are more often economic than physical. So here we have this term popping up in 1929, and it really lay latent for a number of years. Um, but we've begun to utilize it really starting in the 1990s, um, just the last couple of decades again, to think about where we are. And what a little bit of what I'd like to share today is, um, you know, how we've actually begun to think of food sheds at the local level. And um, I want to share a little story from Vermont. And Vermont, as some folks may know, is um, the state which has the highest purchasing of local products of any state in the country. Um, it seems to be far and away at this point the case. And, um, you know, Vermont's interesting because we, as we were really proud of that fact, we were trying to build it out. A lot of us were going to the same funders, uh, that is, a lot of us from different local areas here in Vermont. The funders, the philanthropists, actually at one point just said, stop. There's no coordination that's happening here at the state level, and it's great to have all these local foods, um, you know, enterprises popping up and these different ideas, but there's no coordination at the state or the regional level, and we want to see that. And so essentially, to their credit, they helped fund the process of beginning to put together a community-based, a consensus-based, to the degree that we could do that, um, strategic plan for 10 years for Vermont. And part of that process actually involved creating this diagram. It's a diagram that's somewhat similar um, that you might see in other places. It's a diagram of the Vermont food system. And it's a nice one to tinker with a little bit here as we look at it. So just to walk around that wheel quickly, um, I'd like to, to do that. But first, I'd like to point out the way Vermont is talking about this is a soil-to-soil -soil plan. So really trying to tighten this ecological loop as much as possible and thinking about the soil at the beginning of the process and again at the end. So we have the farm inputs that come in uh, that um, actually also supply a number of jobs, help the economy move along. Then we have the production, that is the farming that's going on. The processing, which is a piece that we really need to um, look much harder at. It's very complex, and it really is the processing infrastructure that got pulled out from under us over the past couple of decades, uh, really arguably the last three generations. And then we have the distribution, the wholesale and the retail, the consumer demand, and then finally the nutrient management. In other words, capturing those resources at the end. Many of us know that we um, waste about 40% of the food in the United States, so it's trying to at least recapture that for fertility's sake and other purposes as much as possible. So that starts to give us a little bit of a sense of what a food system looks like, um, how that actually ties into the concept of a food shed. And frankly, I think we need to think longer, harder, and uh, more collectively about how to combine the food system thinking with the um, what we're trying to push out in terms of our local food sheds.
Thanks, that's really helpful. Now, even though the, the book's focus is largely on rebuilding local food sheds, you actually challenge the idea of local for local sake or as an end-all be-all. Can you talk about why? Sure. Um, yeah, this sign this is a picture I took in Minnesota a couple of weeks ago, and um, it, it gives a little bit of an indication that the the word local is really incredibly complex. You know, it can be claimed um, um, by a number of different parties and persuasions and purposes. Um, you know, but local is a fascinating term. I part of what we've not done a very good job of, and I include myself in this, is um, really some of us being very purist in our notion of what local should be, and um, almost the assumption that you know we can replace everything else with local. Um, that, frankly, in my view, is, is is probably not possible. Local is really nested within regional food systems, our national food system, and certainly the international food system. Um, and so it's not about actually supplanting all of those. It really is about rebuilding local. And the reason for doing that is it's been taken apart now for about three generations. And so it's really this effort to put it back into place, um, to give it prominence. And, you know, it is the, I think, of all those local, regional, national, international, it's the one that we can most trust, the one that we can invest in, and then also reap some of those rewards as we're doing that. Um, so I think we've been a little too simplistic uh, about this whole thing. And um, finally, I think, you know, as I think about food sheds these days, you know, it does make sense to use the term geographically for sure, um, but I also, uh, I've begun thinking about it myself as really being defined by the periphery of our influence to create positive change. You know, how far out can we actually um, really have an impact? And so, you know, this moves us sort of from the hyper-local to the local to the regional, and um, then ultimately to the national. It's not that we should abandon that, but, you know, we know that we can have much more of an impact within our own communities as we try to work together on this work. Thanks. So, you know, we talked a little bit about um, you know, rebuilding food sheds sort of conceptually. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how that effort is actually being manifested on the ground in communities here in the U.S. Sure. The, the, and thanks for asking, because the theory in and of itself is only going to, to get us so far. Um, and the theory really should spin out from the successful models that are out there. So. I'll share just a couple from around the country that I think are really interesting um, to look at. And one that I think um, is not known well enough out there is Athens, Ohio. Um, and Athens, I just really have to admire because what they've been able to do, arguably, um, <laughs> maybe they shouldn't have been able to do it because the odds were against them. Here they are, you know, in the, um, <clears throat> just, in the, just outside the southern Appalachian range just on the edge there, um, economically um, challenged, uh, one might say there in many ways. And yet they've been able to just um, create an incredible local food system, what they in fact and, and some others call a mature local food system. And that's a rarity these days. So Athens is well worth not just looking at, um, but talking to the people there. So they have their 30 meal, uh, I'm sorry, their 30 mile meal. Um, and the number 30 is pretty daring. Um, you know, I think it was pretty gutsy to say they're going to try to create a local food system um, that is really vibrant at this 30-mile radius. Um, so they've created that notion, and I was just there about a month ago, and it's one of the most amazing, if not the most amazing, local food system I've seen in the United States. And there's some pieces of that that I would share that I think are really important. One is ACENET. This is the Appalachian Center for Economic Networks. And this really, in many ways, is the, the heartbeat of Athens, Ohio. And as they've come together, they've provided business training, incubation, uh, the facilities, the infrastructure for actually building out a local food system. You know, they've been able to subsidize um, those for many of the people in the area. And um, you know, that way, it's not been a gentrified approach to rebuilding local food systems. So I just have tremendous respect for what they've done. And um, so you can see here the commercial kitchen. And um, so that's a shared use facility. And um, as multiple different options for people doing every kind of value-added processing you can really think of there, um, be it um, baking, cooking, catering, um, or canning. And then they also, um, and there's a fantastic restaurant, Casa Nueva, which I went to. Um, it's a worker-owned restaurant. Uh, it's been that way since 1985. Fantastic food and drink there, incredibly affordable. 
and obviously the staff are very invested in what's going on um, and one of the really, I, I think, neatest restaurants in the country. Um, and then another piece, and this is something you almost don't see elsewhere in the country. This is Shagbark Seed and Mill. And um, again, I think pretty daring, like the 30 mile um, diet, you know, that proposal. And the reason for that is we tend in this day and age, and even in our hyper local push, we tend to ignore the legumes and the grains. And um, Michelle, who helped start the Shagbark Seed and Mill, as she described it to me, um, she really talked about you know, not just building out the local economy, but also linking it to health of individuals as well as health of the community. So a really important piece there uh, with what they're doing with the milling. And um, then we can move on you know, to the Midwest, and I think it's really interesting to do that because one could say that there's almost a desert of monocultures in the Midwest. So I was lucky enough to be able to visit Luther College uh, just a couple of weeks ago and um, compare notes with folks there in northeastern Iowa. And Luther College in the Midwest is able to purchase more than 30% of the food for the dining halls um, locally. And that's a really high number, and it's one of the most authentic numbers out there. I think we should always um, pry a little bit <laughs> as to um, how folks are getting their numbers here. Um, so Luther is doing a great job also being really a, a centerpiece of the organizing and helping to move along these ideas. In fact, two of their alums are running Four Season Tools or River Root Farm, and um, they've really adopted a lot of the season extension technologies uh, from Elliot Coleman, and he pulled those from uh, the Dutch and from other places. And so they're entering this monocultural environment with diversified products. They're doing it on a relatively small scale, also offering their services for designing these season extension structures. And you can see here they are movable. They're on rails, and you can see just the, what care they're putting into their soils here. And this gives you a little more perspective on their high tunnels for growing greens and other crops. And here you can actually see the, um, the wheels. So these are on tracks, so they can be easily moved um, just by the two farmers there. They can actually move these high tunnels from place to place for fertility management, also for utilizing cold to kill some of the uh, uh, non-beneficials that are there in the greenhouse area. And then they also grow seedlings for people to grow for themselves. They sell those at the co-op there in Decora, Iowa. And that co-op is a really interesting place in and of itself. You can see just um, for a town that size, what a wonderful co-op they have there. And um, part of what the manager talked to me a little bit about there was the fact that um, he and his staff put on workshops um, with some frequency to show people how they can actually buy bulk. And again, when you're thinking bulk, also remember those staple products, those legumes and grains, how they can actually buy things in bulk and save money from buying processed foods. So then as we um, move over to uh, Colorado, a uh, really interesting visit a couple of weeks ago with uh, folks from local Food Shift, Michael Brownlee and others, and um, attended a day-long meeting of uh, people from Boulder and Bo Boulder City and Boulder County thinking about how they needed to build out their local food system. As they were thinking about it, it was a fascinating discussion. Um, I was really, really enjoyed you know, that day-long activity and hearing what they were talking about, about their very um, local food system, but also, again, you know, the, the struggles in trying to figure out what scale is appropriate here. And so um, local food shift and others are proposing that they think about the food shed really as a, um, the front range urban corridor. So that's 18 counties, 4.3 million people, six urban centers, 9 million acres of land. Because there are actually efficiencies in trying to do this more on a regional level and not just on the local level. So then uh, another example that I think is really fascinating is looking at Ocracoke, North Carolina. Um, Ocracoke is in my home state of North Carolina. I'm really fascinated to, to hear this particular story where um, the, the fisher folk there were actually confronted with a dilemma. The fish house, that is where the ice was and where they would cool down the fish and then distribute it, the local fish house there on Ocracoke was about to close. And so uh, a group got together, uh, that they're called the Ocracoke Working Watermen's Association. Uh, they banded together and they decided to actually purchase the ice house, uh, which you can see here. I'll run the mouse over it just a little bit. So it may not look like much, you know, from this backside, but that's the infrastructure upon which that community fishing village was dependent upon. As um, Captain Hardy Plyler said to me, he said, you know, without a fish house, you don't have much fishing, and without fishing, you don't have much of a fishing village to give to the tourists. 
And so this fish house is really important as um, the fishermen come back with their catch. If they did not have it, they would have to go travel an additional five hours to the mainland in order to um, drop off the fish. There would be higher spoilage, and it's also time that they really can't invest in the process. So um, this is the inside of the facility. And then, um, you know, for my family, the hot Vermonters down there, he opened up the ice so my kids could get a little taste of Vermont on the inside there. Um, so Ocracoke was fascinating, tell some of the story that we need to think about in terms of um, the marine aspects here. And then I'd, I'd like to wrap this up here with the Mohawk community. <clears throat> and um, this comes by way of one of my graduate students, uh, Jade Gabry, who really opened my eyes in many ways in thinking about the Mohawk community and um, considering the food shed there. And one of the things that Jade shared with me, she put together this graphic that she adapted from elsewhere. Um, she said that it's not just about the infrastructure, it's not just about the production, it's about the processes and the, um, the historical and cultural processes in transforming you know, these raw products into food. And as she said, you know, without actually having the language that told people how um, to process their food, how to create it, how to appreciate it, they no longer had a food shed. So really an eye-opening experience for me in that regard. Thank you. Those are some great examples. Um, and, and I think you touched about, upon this a little bit, especially when you were talking about um, the community in Athens, Ohio. But can you talk a little bit about how we can get the local and sustainable food movement to go beyond those with means uh, and make it more sort of egalitarian and part of the, the, the core fabric of communities? Right. Well, and I, I think that is, you know, Sharon mean, comprises a substantial part of the book because I think, um, you know, local has gotten some dings uh, for being somewhat elitist or not really addressing some of the um, issues out there that are really the, the toughest in many ways. And um, they're, I don't know that they're too easy to overlook, but they have been overlooked. So um, share a couple of slides with you here. There are three maps. Um, the first one is on poverty. The next one is obesity. And the next one is diabetes. And um, what one starts to see in looking at these maps are the points of overlap. Um, and that just sort of adds to the culminating tragedy, I think, in each of those areas. Um, and what it also speaks to is we look at these three maps, and I'll scroll through here. So this is poverty. This is obesity. And this is diabetes. So what this starts to speak to, I think, is that um, you know, local in one place um, can't necessarily be replicated. The problems are different, and therefore the solutions are also different. So you know, certainly I, I hope that this book doesn't appear as formulaic, because um, I, I think these things really have to spring forth from the community, and people need to actually see what the issues are and try to address those as best they can. Um, and then you know, there are other things that we don't look at very carefully. Um, if we're really talking about trying to share resources, be more egalitarian, really bring more people into the fold here, then we've also got to recognize some of the travesties of the past that have created the injustices of the present. Uh, those are here, as you can see. Uh, this is a table that's in the book, um, easily available data. Um, but just for example, you know, look at the category here, you know, black farmers. You know, they're much lower in terms of acreage. Uh, the value of sales, much, much lower than um, the other groups represented here. Um, <clears throat> less than $10,000 in terms of their sales and government payments, you know, almost four-fifths of them. Lack of internet access and certainly the highest average age. So we've got to think about what's happening on the farm and how we can rectify that. We also need to be thinking about uh, the people who are working, who are really building this food system. Um, these are the farm workers. Finally, we're beginning to pay more attention to what's going on here. Um, I think we can give ourselves a pat on the back, but the work's not done yet. And then, you know, one of the places that um, you know disturbs me the most, and it's perhaps even more hidden than what happens in the field sometimes, and that is the processing sector. And this is um, from Hamlet, North Carolina. Uh, it's next door to where my grandparents' farm in North Carolina is, uh, the next town over. And um, there were, I believe, 25 workers who were killed in this fire. Uh, the doors were chained shut. Uh, they were locked shut, as purportedly so the workers couldn't hand food out the back door. Um, and a number of other folks who were injured, uh, disabled for the rest of their lives. So I, you know, the point here is we've really got to be paying much more attention to the 
processing sector. And these people, you know, the food system's built up on their backs. And then, you know, just to make us uh, aware that there are possibilities here, we, we do get banged over the head with the elitist hammer every now and then. But I think Linda Watson, who um, her website Cook for Good, she's based in North Carolina, um, she does a really wonderful job here of trying to lay out how folks can actually buy what she calls thrifty meals or even green meals that are organic, sustainable, um, local. So how a family can do that even at the food stamps level. And um, I'd really encourage folks to look at the website and, and also at her recipes. And they're actually delicious recipes as well. So I think there's hope here. I think we've got to look harder, talk more, maybe cook together, and certainly eat more meals together in the end. Yeah. Um, really appreciate uh, those comments. So, what do you actually what do you say to people who want to add, to help rebuild their food sheds, but really don't know where to start? Yeah, I guess to start out with, you know, I, I like to think of it in concentric circles. You know, and again, we can think of that sort of as the the hyper local, uh, hyper hyper local, I suppose, is is home in many ways. Um, you know, what can we do at home, and then how can we step it out a little bit? So. I'll walk through a couple of examples that I think probably make a lot of sense. One that people don't necessarily think of right off the bat, um, wild crafting. This is one of my friends, um, <clears throat> Les Hook and Nova Kim, his partner, are two dear friends, uh, and they um, do a phenomenal job in going out and collecting uh, wild edibles and also teaching others um, and even putting together a book for people of lower income to know what's out there right around them um, that they can collect and eat safely. And eat safely is obviously an important word there. Um, one of the things that we can do to really contribute um, to our own production, be it on the, the balcony, the terrace, the backyard, the community garden, is compost, recapturing as much as we can of that 40% food waste, um, rebuilding that into the system, uh, keeping a tight ecological loop. Uh, this is from Detroit, uh, from D-Town Farms. And, um, and this is Jackie Hunt, also at D-Town Farms, showing a composting sifter, you know, whereas the urban environments you know, really have to remediate the soils, capture as much as we can in fertility. And um, so little efficiencies like this um, particular device, which is built on casters, really important. Um, and this is the end result of that good compost, uh, several garden beds tr planted there at D-Town Farms by third graders. Um, and then we can, you know, step it up even a bit more. Uh, this is actually my office, uh, the farmhouse at Green Mountain College, the Solar Harvest Center. Um, we decided we needed to um, put into practice what we believe, and that is we have a college farm. We also needed to um, do away with the lawn on the front, so worked with 25 students over the course of several days. And um, we literally, this is five days later, um, obviously had a lot of great help there with the students. Um, but again, lots of good lessons for the students, and this picture was taken just this morning, a year later. Um, so there's incredible potential that's waiting in our lawns, and um, much, much more vibrant and interesting than the typical landscape, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, we can invest in co-ops, open those up. We've done that in our small town of Pulteney here, Green Mountain College, with the help of a variety of community members. So those co-ops are very important. Even just the basic grocery store. Um, in Cody, <clears throat> Nebraska, the population, I believe it's a 148 last I heard. They um, didn't have a grocery store for um, within a radius of about 28 miles. So the elementary school teachers got together with their students and then pulled in the rest of the community and actually decided to build their own grocery store, which just opened this spring. This is the Circle C Market. And um, the community got together a straw bale structure, put this up. Um, and you can see a really neat community event. And so sometimes it doesn't have to just be the um, kind of crunchy <laughs> co-op, but also just the basic grocery store. And then, um, you know, there are other ways. This is just outside of Albany, New York. I stumbled into this in a rest area, so a farmer's market in a rest area. What a great place to have people actually pick up their supplies. And uh, also, as you walk into the rest area, um, they had beautiful displays on New York produce, so really touting um, all the best of what New York has to offer. So we can get creative and do some pretty funky things that are really a lot of fun. Um, also, you know, not just doing these summer farmers markets, but also creating winter farmers markets like this one. This one is in Rutland, Vermont. And if you can do it in Rutland, Vermont, you can do it anywhere. Uh, this um, 
farmer's market. Rutland was the first uh, place in the state of Vermont to have a farmer's market up and running for um, 365 days a year. Um, and, and no one else um, had done that at this point in the state of Vermont. So I'm really proud of that fact. And that really helps the farmer's bottom line, is keeping the customers coming all the time. And um, you know, college students, you can dive right in here. The Real Food Challenge is a fascinating project um, that students can, can and should actually get involved in for the dining halls. You know, About 50% of the food that we consume now is outside of the home. There are a lot of dollars involved there. And when we look at um, what happens in terms of colleges and universities, it's about $5 billion we spend on food. So the Real Food Challenge is pushing this notion that, they need, um, that we really need to at least see if we can find a way to get it 20% of that, $1 billion. And think about what that does to the communities surrounding those colleges and universities. So there are um, you know, lots of opportunities there. And then finally, you know, the public schools, and this may be one of the most challenging and difficult um, aspects of all of this, but really being able to tie into the public schools and, and link them with local farms, um, it's just a, it's a fantastic opportunity. As you can see here, the number of schools involved right now, it's just over 12,000 schools around the country. It's not an easy fix by any means, but this is one of the places where you know, it really brings a lot of people together. And um, no matter where one starts, you know, with pushing forward with uh, the local food agenda or community-based food systems, I think what you quickly recognize is that everything is connected to everything else. So maybe it doesn't matter so much where you start. It's just important that we start. Yeah, thanks. And these are a lot of uh, wonderful examples that I think cover a pretty broad range of ways that people can, can be engaged, you know, from purchasing power to the educational system. A lot of the people that are, I think, that are interested in this conversation, that signed up for this this chat, um, are folks that are involved on the community level in things like the transition movement, you know, and, and those people are concerned about sustainability issues and, and the resilience of their community. So can you talk a little bit about sort of the role of citizens group, citizen groups? They're not necessarily food you know, food groups specifically, but what roles for they can play? And I know you mentioned, for example, the work that's happening in Boulder County. And I understand that Michael Brownlee's group sort of comes from the, the transition community as well. So I don't know if there's any, any example that you can pull from that, but just to, just to sort of relate it to a lot of the, the transition type or organizations and, and citizen groups out there. Maybe. Right. Now, I, I think a pattern that I'm seeing a share out there, you know, um, both in doing the research for the book and now traveling around and, and working with different community groups, um, it, it does matter um, to really try to find ways to engage the state level whenever possible, um, because there is so much support that can come by way of the state. It may not necessarily be monetary, but it might be policy-based. Um, certainly can help in terms of economic development opportunities, really having an ally there. Um, you know, and I think it is an easier situation in which to, to really accomplish a lot when the, the state level is involved. Um, you know, if we shrink that down just a, a bit, I think is, you know, transition groups and others really look um, to help us get a, a solid foot in the door here. Um, it's very important, really, for us to be able to find ways to deal with them. Municipalities and zoning ordinances, um, and by that I mean everything from being able to have a garden in the front yard to be able to, um, you know, have a garden in the backyard for that matter, or be able to plant corn because you know certain zoning regulations actually um, don't allow corn to be planted because it's too high, or don't allow trellis tomatoes. Um, you know, then also really community planning efforts. I, I think, and again, I love maps as I think folks can see here because I think it. It provides us with a visual vision, you know, the way of actually trying to see what might happen over time. And so one of the really important pieces is the community-based planning, thinking about the land base. For agricultural production, also thinking about the land base, you know, where can we bring in some of these businesses? You know, for example, the um, processing and distribution sector, where can we bring those into some of the um, really beleaguered areas, these economic development zones? Um, so there's just there's tremendous room at the table, as far as I'm concerned, for people who are forward thinking and want to make sure that policy actually aims in that direction. 
and um, that there was not a bunch of policy navel gazing going on. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Um, you know, and, and you know, relating to to the groups that are on the ground, they're concerned about climate and other sustainability issues. I think part of the push towards local food has been driven by by people who you know are concerned about sort of the climate impacts or um, the energy intensity of, of food that comes from far away. You know, with the average piece of, of of food in the United States coming from 200 to 3,000 miles away. But something you talked about in rebuilding the food shed is challenging people, I think, to think a little differently about energy and how it relates to food. And um, and it might not be that the, the biggest energy sinks are, are the ones that people tend to think about. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about that. Right. I, I think a, a lot of folks, myself included here, um, we started out this conversation and thinking about and talking about and pushing for local um, local food in terms of food miles. And um, it's not that that was misguided, but I think in terms of priorities, um, there are actually other things we should think about uh, that are perhaps more important. Certainly, they're more energy intensive. Um, you know, numbers are, are always, um, maybe they're not suspect, but um, <laughs> we can come at numbers in a lot of different ways. But the transportation sector in the United States, it, Looks like it probably consumes about 13% of the um, the energy in the food system. When you start breaking that down, and you look at um, pesticides and fertilizers. We're closer to 35% in terms of um, where the energy is going. And then also when we start looking at um, home preparation and storage, that actually is the largest um, draw in terms of the energy that's utilized in food systems. So it does make sense to really think from this um, hyper level. <laughs> or hyper-local level, uh, thinking about the home, you know, starting there and then moving out because we can have more energy-efficient appliances. Uh, we can certainly do, um, you know, maybe even less cooking, but certainly more cooking with fresh foods. Um, fermentation really makes a lot of sense in my mind, just the fact that it is um, fairly low on the energy-intensive nature, and then it's also, um, you know, very healthy. So, you know, I, I think we need to not just be talking about food miles and really start starting to look at these other things. And, um, and I'm very wedded to this whole notion of focusing on energy invested in our food systems. But I think um, there are certain times when we perhaps uh, we, we utilize that and we focus so much just on the energy sector in some circles. Um, I really encourage folks also to bear in mind that this is a, the food justice issues out there are enormous and um, we don't want to get pigeonholed in the way that we're approaching you know, what we need to change here. Yeah, appreciate that. You, um, you talked a little bit about education, the role of public schools uh, earlier, and um, you're a professor, so you, and you're, you're teaching young people who are obviously very engaged and passionate about, about the food system. And we also hear lots of talk, at least within, within these circles, of, you know, about um, the aging population of farmers, you know, it's a very small population to begin with, and, and then it's an aging one. So have you seen with kind of the explosion of interest in, in sustainable food, um, any shift in terms of the demographics of, of young people being more engaged? And then, you know, what's what's driving them? What's kind of the, the thing that you're seeing in terms of their interest and, and how are they getting plugged in and what are their, their barriers, I guess, for them to be part of this? This uh, food revolution that we're we're all part of, right? Well, you know, I have reason to be incredibly optimistic about what the future might bring. Um, I hope it's not just for a small sector of our, our society. Um, just coming to work every day and seeing the enthusiasm that's there among the students, the intellectual curiosity, the passion that they bring, and um, you know, and they want to do things. They want to get things done. Um, they they, they do want to study, um, you know, and and do the book thing. But they want to see change, and they need to see change, um, probably more than any generation up to this particular point in time. Um, so I think when we look back at our public schools, and just to start out with here, the, um, the public schools, the fact that we've actually ripped out so much of vocational education that's there, actually teaching students you know, how to do agriculture, how to actually repair things, how to build things. Um, it's it's really a travesty for the future of doing that, and the fact that we bifurcated it so that you know we're saying either you go that track, the little bit that's left, or you go you know sort of the college prep track. That's really problematic. I mean, these things need to be converging. They need to be coming together. 
And um, at the higher education level, you know, one of the beauties of this, and I just came back from a conference, which was gathering of academics from all across the country, looking at agriculture and uh, food and human values, looking at the studies within the university curricula. Um, it's really fascinating. It's growing leaps and bounds. Um, we actually, the whole notion of um, food systems is really a new notion in the academic world, relatively new. Um, it's a new discipline, as we're calling it, an emerging discipline. And I think that's great because now we're beginning to take a much more sophisticated look at it all. My um, caveat there is, and it makes me a bit nervous, when we academics get a hold of something and we try to put it all into theory and <laughs> we quickly shift away here from actually doing and learning by doing and getting our hands dirty, we can't do food systems from up above and not from the meta approach. We got to get in, we got to get down, we got to get dirty and then figure it out. And then we can move up to the meta realms and feel um, relatively confident that we've come up with some solutions and theories that really make sense here. Yeah. And, and your students and the, and the other students you see out there, what, what's the career pathway for them? I mean, is it, you, you caution about just going down sort of the academic route. Um, so, you know, what are pathways for young people? And, and maybe talk a little bit about ownership, you know, because I know that that's a concerning issue as well, which is you know, trying to pr provide opportunity for people that um, are either young or don't have a lot of financial means to, to be able to, to farm. It's not an easy occupation by any stretch of imagination, very hard to break through, and then even ownership of land is a huge issue. So um, maybe you could just talk about those two things. Sure. Um, you know, I think it, it's incredibly exciting to see what young people are doing uh, when they leave, not just the college environment, but also high school. And, you know, as they're, they're trying to find their way, you know, into careers that make sense. I mean, certainly some here at Green Mountain College are settling right in the area. That's the beauty of, of what I get to see every day. And, and actually farming very often after four, five, even 10 years of apprenticeships where they've learned from others and also gotten networked into the, into the community um, here. That's a really important piece. Um, you know, it's not just an immediate leap for those who are farming. But, you know, a lot of others who are going into, um, you know, areas of food processing, even food distribution to some degree, food security work, food policy is enormous, food and agricultural policy right now. Um, so really seeing that begin to happen, um, I think one of the things we have to be aware of, and we've got to figure out a way to fix this, um, we encourage people and we educate them and we also have them take student loans out in many cases, sometimes too much, um, is that these jobs aren't always, they don't pay what they should. And as you allude to as well with the ownership question, um, you know, almost all of this work in terms of actually producing food and getting it to the consumer, it's capital intensive. It doesn't matter whether it's actually um, buying a farm, getting that farm up and running, or even renting a farm. Um, there's a lot of capital that has to go in there, and there's a heck of a lot of capital that has to go into the processing sector. In some ways, you know, one might argue that's even a little bit harder, um, in part because the regulatory environment is becoming so intense, and some of that is justified and appropriate, um, but it's not always scale specific, and it really does limit people. So it does feel good to me to see these innovative um, kinds of programs that are popping up out there for financing, whether someone wants to buy land, open a restaurant, become a processor, become a distributor. You know, we are getting really creative you know, with the slow money kind of approach. So it, it, it feels good, it feels promising, but no one should be under the illusion that this is easy and doesn't take a lot of sweat equity, and I'm afraid lost sleep you know, as well some nights. Yeah, hey, you, um, you talked about the regulatory environment a little bit. Are there, can you share any examples of communities that have really successfully engaged their, their um, local government in rebuilding the food system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the places that, that comes to mind fairly quickly is um, Cleveland, Ohio, which I haven't had the chance to visit. Um, but, you know, as I've, I've looked and heard, I think one of the really interesting things happening there, which is has parallels in Detroit, Oakland, um, some other places in the country, you know, is, is just this push to find ways to actually utilize some of the vacant land that's out there. Um, some of the approaches that are happening out there, um, some, some people call it the new Homestead Act, but essentially trying to figure out what to do with vacant lots or abandoned um, houses or other buildings, um, and, and actually trying to create vibrant neighborhoods, you know, by way of green growth, be that vegetative or uh, economic development. 
but really trying to find ways in which to provide opportunities. And um, it always reminds me of a, um, an example from the Alps. The, the Alpine farmers there um, would use a dialect word, putu, and which, which means advantage. They would always talk about um, turning any disadvantage into an advantage. So if you've got steep slopes, you have icy slopes, um, you've got a lot of snow on the ground, figure out a way to use that to your advantage. And that's really what so much of this is about. Um, something that you and I talked about you know, earlier today was uh, sort of the situation with, and, and we talked, we touched on energy a, a little bit earlier, um, the relationship between food and energy. And we talked a little bit about the, what's happening in terms of uh, the spread of, of fracking, particularly on farmland, and also um, with corn-based ethanol. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about uh, the relationship between those two things and what you've been seeing out there and, and the pressures on the food system as a result of, of fracking or ethanol production and other types of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, you know, it's it's something actually that I'm um, you know, being somewhat insulated here in Vermont, you know, from that discussion um, it caught me a, a bit by surprise in, in some ways, and yet it probably shouldn't have. Um, you know, but in traveling around, and, and certainly this came to the fore in Colorado, um, and, and talking to folks there, but you know, part of what's happening is that some of the best farmland in the country that we have, uh, that we're very dependent upon, um, you know, whether we, you know, whether folks want to uh, ad admit it or not, you know, that farmland, uh, those farmers in many cases have really been challenged financially over the years. It's not always, it's probably almost never been easy to make a go of it, but certainly um, there've been plenty of really hard years. So for some, fracking actually looks to um, hold some financial promise for them, either in supporting their farm infrastructure or as they try to transition out and get out from under some of the weight of all that capital investment that they put in there. Um, you know, and so that starts to create issues in and of itself. And then suddenly when you hit particularly the state level and you have um, the fracking interest actually start to step into the, um, the politics of what's going on at the state level, then suddenly, um, the agencies of agriculture, departments of agriculture, they're getting hijacked. You know, for Pete's sake, they're getting hijacked actually by the fracking interest in many cases. Um, and so to step out and actually push back against that is anathema, you know, certainly under the rotundas of various um, states and also in certain social circles. And, and that, for me, is really problematic. Um, you know, when various organizations that are supposed to be promoting agriculture actually starts you know, um, to ally themselves you know, with fracking interest makes no sense to me. I mean, we're losing soil, we're losing fertility, we're losing economic development opportunities, and we're certainly losing uh, clean sources of water upon which we're so dependent in order to actually generate healthy food, not just for local communities, you know, but for our entire country in many cases in the breadbasket. And, and what about ethanol? I mean, there's, obviously there's been pressure on the food system as a result of switching over, you know, to uh, ethanol production. And, um, you know, how, how do communities sort of address that issue? Is it is it something that we have to engage in in terms of all the way up to the farm bill, you know? Or, um, you know, what are ways that people can be thinking about uh, pushing back on that and on the pressures? Because I think that, uh, you know, we've got, we've got a number of different factors happening here. We've got you know, growing populations in the world with, you know, growing uh, consumer desires, you know, Western type diets, um, and then a growing demand for energy and alternatives to fossil fuels and just how those two things meet, you know. Um, so any thoughts ab about that intersection? Right. You know, it's 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 a tough one in the farm community, and it's hard to have the conversations about ethanol in certain parts of the country in particular. Um, you know, without polarizing the discussion from the very beginning. And um, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm interested in trying to get people of different persuasions to have conversations together to see if we can have, find common ground to have some positive change. Um, so um, uh, my critique of ethanol is, um, you know, I, I, I'm really concerned about where it's, it's taking us for a number of reasons. I understand to some degree why some farmers have gone that route. Um, I, you know, have to respect people's decisions to some degree. But it really has created enormous issues for us. Um, 
I, I think it's a system that's going to cave on its own weight over time. And when that happens, farmers are caught in that infrastructural web. They're caught by the capital intensive nature of the investments they've made. Others uh, who are in the ethanol industry are also going to be caught in that trap. The U.S. taxpayer is going to be caught in that trap. Um, and uh, so I, you know, my sense is it's a fairly short-lived industry because no matter how you look at return on investment, um, it's very short-lived for everyone. And um, you know, last year's drought simply exacerbated the situation. Also, I think helped show the fragility of our food system, particularly when in uh, you know the land base and production base is tied so tightly to um, energy systems that don't have to be there. I mean, if farmers are going to invest in energy systems, you know, then let's create incentives for them to do solar, to do winds, um, to do other renewable energy systems, which we are doing, and and those things are making sense in many places around the country. Um, you know, but as soon as you go in the ethanol route as a farmer, you're beholden to someone else's interest and someone else's economy. And, um, you know, I think the payoffs are, are ultimately fairly short. You know, there is a boom that's happening out in the, uh, the heartland of the United States. There's no question about that in terms of um, the prices farmers are getting. Um, I don't begrudge farmers, you know, finally being able to make some profits. Um, they, you know, they've all had a, a hard road uh, here. Um, but I think it's a, you know, it's a short-term, really, prescription for collapse, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, so I want to switch gears a little bit. You talked earlier about transparency and that being sort of one of the benefits of, of rebuilding local or regional food sheds. Um, and, you know, from my own experience, uh, going to the farmer's market every week, you know, and, and buying produce from local farmers, small farmers, who, don't have the capacity to go through kind of a certification process for organic and just looking them in the eye and asking them if they, they spray, you know, or not. And, um, and so that trust factor, I think, is really key. Can you talk about the, the importance of trust and relationships and kind of the inter the, the relationship of trust and, and, and how that plays into rebuilding food sheds? Yeah, I, I think it's a huge piece. I, I think we've, um, probably struggled to verbalize it in some ways. We've even been critiqued for putting that forward as something that's that's guaranteed um, in local food relationships. And, you know, I, I don't want to say it's guaranteed, but I think there's a heck of a lot better chance that, um, you know, your, your, tr your trust um, can be respected, appreciated, um, and honored in these local food systems. Because, as you say, it is it's looking the farmer in the eye in many cases, um, and that's a very important piece. I mean, commerce, you know, this <laughs> originally, these kinds of transactions were based on, you know, face-to-face -face, um, economies. And so I think a lot of us are trying to get back to that. And, you know, in some some of us, uh, we use the certifications. Uh, we're, we're very wedded to using those as consumers as well as farmers. Um, they are helpful because everything's not going to be local, so the certifications... Um, they do have a role to play, but they're you know they're really not ever as genuine um, as you know, just these relationships that, that are built on trust, as you say. And and the transparency factor again, it's not guaranteed, um, but it's highly probable. Just the fact that you get to drive back and forth in many cases, you know, beside or alongside one of the farms that you maybe invest in, you get to see it on a day-to-day -day basis, and you also get to appreciate the landscape that's created there. So. I think it's a win-win. It's not guaranteed, but there's a pretty good darn chance it's a better way to go. Now, here's a question that was submitted to us from someone. So it's easy to criticize Walmart, but what about Whole Foods and sustainably produced but commercially distributed companies like Stony Fold Yogurt? Should we see them as enemies or allies as, um, in terms of building the new food paradigm? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's it's dangerous almost in all cases. Maybe even with Walmart, Walmart um, to assume enemy status in any category. Um, I'm not one that that trusts Walmart's motives. Um, you know, there's certainly when you guarantee the low prices, then um, I don't want to be the farmer on the other end of that deal. That's for sure. Um, you know, but I, I with the Walmart piece, I was reminded uh, by uh, one person in one of the minority communities that um. You know, I and others probably need to be a little less quick to make that judgment because Walmart and their community um, may be the only source they have for fresh vegetables. It's probably the only one in some communities where they have access to organic. So even there, we get into a bit of a quandary. Um, 
you know, but then we, when we start talking about places like Stonyfield, um, you know, in, in my mind, there is no perfect business <laughs> that's out there. I mean, my farm, I try to do the best I can on my farm, but I know it's not perfect. Um, I know Stonyfield's not perfect. But I'm really impressed with a heck of a lot of what they do, um, and I think as a consumer, um, an advocate, I can certainly push back if there's something that I see that's problematic there. Um, you know, but on the other hand, when you look at places um, you know, like Stonyfield, I mean, I have to be impressed with the way that they treat many of their farmers, many of their um, employees, uh, some of the benefits. You know, one of the graduate students that I have now um, is in the program with the support of Stonyfield. Um, and, you know, and so it really is a question in many cases of, um, you know, how these companies are performing, not just financially, but within their own communities. And we've got to recognize we've got to scale this thing up. You know, if we want sustainable, it's not always going to be at the hyper local and the local level. It's got to be at the mid scale level sometimes. It's got to be at the regional level. If 50% of our food almost is coming from, you know, away from the home now. These, these entities have to exist, there's, there's no question. So we need to support the best ones um, that we can as we go along as consumers and advocates. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna switch gears to talk about urban because I think that a lot of people uh, in urban communities feel that they have very different constraints to work with, obviously, than those that are in, in more rural communities. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about what you've seen in terms of both the challenges and, and the creative ways that the groups, you know, in urban communities have have gone about rebuilding their own kitchens. Yeah, I, I think the beauty of what's happened with urban agriculture just in the last, I'd say, five years, certainly ten years, is that um, those constraints have really been transformed into creative opportunities. Um, I'm really excited to see what's out there and what's happening. Um, certainly, my students are. They're all about it. They're all over urban agriculture. Even you know the the media is there and and really shining a light on it. And I think it's fantastic um, because part of this thing of rebuilding local food systems is you know finding ways to let the goodness come out of the cracks, if you will. Um, you know, we're really trying to just I guess leverage all the resources we possibly can in order to to make a more food secure environment and make sure that the food is healthier. So with urban agriculture, I think it's incredibly exciting to look at the community gardens, to look at the education that's happening uh, with public schools, um, to some degree in some places, actually the transformation of neighborhoods, you know, based on not just a garden, but also the network of relationships that are um, stemming from that. You know, rooftop gardens, the possibilities there seem to be fairly endless, um, certainly also being able to mitigate some of the environmental um, constraints within the city. Um, and so we certainly, it's, it's almost still completely untapped. And I think that's the real beauty of this whole thing um, is that there's so much potential. As to whether it's actually going to solve the food security dilemmas, I'm not so sure about that. And, you know, different figures out there. Some um, cities, they seem to um, have relatively good data. It looks like maybe within the city um, confines they can produce 5% of the city's food. Some have said, you know, maybe it's closer to 30%. I don't know, and I'm not sure ultimately it really matters. It's, it's the act, it's the process, it's the community engagement. Um, you know, those are the pieces that really matter. I do think we've got to find ways to actually bring some of the, um, the agricultural savvy. Uh, it, it's in the urban environments, but it also, there's a lot of it out there in the rural environments. Um, try to make sure that we really, um, not all of this is just being done on a hobby scale. Um, and, we need some good professional farmers to help out. And finally, we really need to be having much richer, not just conversations, but exchanges, I think, between urban communities and rural communities. Getting those conversations going um, and trading resources, ideas, networks. And ultimately, um, you know, it doesn't have to just be about buying from your local community. It can be connecting local communities so that they're buying from one another and supporting the causes in those different places. Yeah, well said. So uh, one of the questions that we we got submitted earlier was wanting to know what had, what inspired you to actually write this book and and who you know who should read it what's what's sort of the audience for rebuilding the future? Yeah, well, I have to pass that one back to you, Asher, and also <laughs> Post Carbon Institute. I think it was the the wisdom of PCI and then also Chelsea Green of coming together 
not just to do this book on rebuilding the food shed, but also to do Michael Schumann's book and Greg Paul's book. You know, so really to, to pull together these pieces that are left on their own too often. You know, the notion of food shed, energy, economics. Um, you know, it it really uh, the task upon us is essentially um, you know, you know, kind of to to read those three books or books like them and and really start to um think much more from a systems perspective, really try to figure out how we deal with these things complexly. Um, and that's the audience that I think I'm looking for, not folks who are just waving the local flag, um, but folks who really want to not just think hard about this, but actually get things done. Um, but the foundation upon which we build you know, all of these hopes and desires in terms of community-based food systems, it rests upon the complexity and the assiduousness that we have in rebuilding those food systems right now at the foundational level. Otherwise, you know, this thing's not going to sustain itself. And that's really what I want to see happen is that these things are built out while we have the energy, we have the media focus, we have the dollars rolling in, turn it into infrastructure, into projects, into community-based um, alliances, and build that thing out as fast as we can while the issue is hot. So, um Last question, and that is, when you think about, say, 10 years from now, what is your vision for, you know, uh, the food system here in, in the United States? Um, and what, what in your mind will it take to sort of get there? Right. I, I certainly don't want to quote Mao Zedong, you know, <laughs> 10,000 flowers bloom. That that would be bad precedent, but... Um, yeah, you know, I, I think the the issue here is really, um, you know, trying not just to hope for, but really to provide resources for communities to find their own solutions that really make sense, um, you know, in building out the notion of, of what is a sustainable, just food shed um, in their areas, but not stopping there, you know, really creating the alliances between those communities uh, so that it is a joint effort, um, because that really is the, the building of the ground up as we move toward the national, um, it, it really is these uh, these kinds of alliances um, that are built on experiments. And I think what we've got to recognize in all of this, and it, it's hard to do it, and the critics, um, you know, certainly take hold in, of it and create issues for us. Um, it's messy. It involves compromises. It involves failures sometimes. Um, you know, but ultimately, all of it is an incredible learning process. And you know, there are enough successes. They're already out there. As we look at the food dollars that are going toward local, you know, it's growing at an incredible rate. Same with organic. Um, so we're on our way there, but still, you know, we're at the point where no matter how we measure it, it's it's really less than 5%, no matter whether you measure by uh, dollars or acres or anything else. Um, we got a long ways to go, and we can get depressed about that, or we can feel like it is the land of opportunity, and um, a land of opportunity for people of different persuasions, different perspectives, different politics, um, to really build out these community-based food systems that make sense and that actually give us the one inalienable right that we have, and that is to healthy food. Really appreciate that. Well said. So I want to thank you again for taking the time. Thank you for writing the book. Um, I think uh, I obviously highly recommend that to everyone. Um, and I want to let folks know who, who've taken the time to watch this that this is the first in a series of, of community resilience chats that we're doing. And uh, so please stay tuned for more. And we're also going to be putting up uh, probably where you're viewing this thing. You'll see that there's some additional resources that we've provided for you. So again, thanks so much, Philip. Um, take care, and I will talk to you soon.